One MiG-29 was flying. The others were in the hardened shelters the Americans had only just finished at the end of runway 11. The fighter's mission was twofold. It was a standing combat air patrol aircraft should an incoming raid be detected. But more importantly, it was being tracked carefully by the ground radar controllers. Their radar needed to be calibrated. Iceland's irregular terrain made for troublesome radar performance. And as with the surface-to-air missiles, the instruments themselves had been badly jostled by the trip aboard the Pusik. The fighter flew circles around the airport while the radar operators determined that what their instruments told them was correct. The fighters were fully fueled and armed, their pilots resting on cots near them. At the moment, the Bowsers were fueling the Badger bomber that had given the fighters navigational and electronic support. Soon it would be leaving to bring in nine more. The Air Force detachment was rapidly finishing their job of clearing the airfield. All but one of the runways was swept clear of fragments now. The remains of the American aircraft had been bulldozed off the pavement. The fuel pipeline would be repaired in an hour, the engineer said. Quite a busy day, the Major said to the fighter commander. It's not over yet. I'll feel better when we get the rest of the regiment in, the Colonel observed quietly. They should have hit us already. How do you expect them to attack? The colonel shrugged. Hard to say. If they're really serious about closing this field, they'll use a nuclear warhead. Are you always so optimistic, comrade colonel? The raid was an hour away. The 18B-52H bombers had left Louisiana ten hours before and landed to refuel at Sandra Strom Air Force Base on Greenland's west coast. Fifty miles ahead of them were a single Raven EF-111 jamming aircraft and four F-4 Phantoms configured for defense suppression. The radar was about halfway calibrated, though what had been done was the easy part. The fighter that had just landed had flown racetrack ovals from due north around the western horizon to due south of Keflavik. The area to the west of the airbase, though not exactly flat, was nearly so, with low, rocky hills. Next came the hard part, plotting radar coverage of the eastern arc over Iceland's mountainous center, a solid collection of hills that worked up to the island's tall central peak. Another fulcrum rolled off the runway to begin this task, its pilot wondering how long it might take to map all the nulls, areas blanked to radar coverage by the steep valleys, areas that an attacking aircraft could use to mask its approach to Keflavik. The radar officers were plotting probable troublesome spots on their topographical maps when an operator shouted a warning. Their clear radar screens had just turned to hash from powerful electronic jammers. That could mean only one thing. The klaxons sounded in the fighter shelters at the end of runway 11. Fighter pilots, who had been dozing or playing dominoes, jumped to their feet and raced to their aircraft. The tower officer lifted the field phone to give more exact warning to the fighters, then called up the missile battery commander. Incoming air raid! Men leaped into action all across the airbase. The fighter ground crews hit the built-in self-starters turning the jet engines even as the pilots climbed into the cockpit. The SAM battery turned on its search and fire control systems while the launch vehicles slewed their missiles into firing position. Just under the radar horizon, 18 B-52 bombers had just lit off their ECM jamming systems. They were deployed in six groups of three each. The first skimmed over the top of Mount Snifels, 60 miles north of Keflavik, and the rest came from all around the west side of the compass, converging on the target behind a wall of electronic noise provided by their own systems and the supporting EF-111 Raven jammer. The Russian fighter just lifting off climbed to altitude, the pilot keeping his radar off as he scanned the sky visually, waiting for intercept information from the ground-based radar. His comrades were even now taxiing into the open, racing straight down the runway and into the sky.
Edwards's head jerked up at the noise, the distinctive roar of jet fighters. He saw a dark trail of smoke approaching in from the east, and the silhouettes passed within a mile. The shapes were heavy with ordnance, the up-angled wingtips making identification easy. F-4s! He hooted. There are guys! They were phantom jets of the New York Air National Guard, configured as wild weasel sand colors. While Russian attention was on the converging bomber raid, they skimmed over hilltops and down valleys, using the crenellated landscape to mask their low-level approach. The backseat crewmen in each aircraft counted the missile radars, selecting the most dangerous targets. When they got to within 10 miles of Kepovic, they popped up high and fired a salvo of standard arm and radar missiles. The Russians were caught by surprise. Laboring to direct missile fire at the bombers, they didn't expect a two-part raid. The incoming missiles were not detected. Three of the arms found targets, killing two search radars and a missile launch vehicle. One launch commander turned his vehicle around and trained manually on the new threat. The Phantoms jammed his fire control radar, leaving behind a series of chaff clouds as they came in at 30 foot height. As each pilot raced to the target area assigned to him, he conducted a hasty visual search. One saw an undamaged SAM launcher and streaked toward it, dropping rock-eye cluster bomb canisters that fell short but spread over a hundred bomblets all over the area. The SA-11 launcher exploded in his wake. Its crew never knew what had happened. A thousand yards beyond it was a mobile anti-aircraft gun vehicle. A Phantom engaged it with his own cannon, badly damaging it as he swept across the rest of the peninsula and escaped back over the sea. A cloud of chaff and flares in his wake. All four aircraft were gone before the Soviet missile crews were able to react. The two SAMs that were launched exploded harmlessly in craft clouds. The battery had lost two-thirds of its launcher vehicle and all of its search radars. Three of the mobile guns were also destroyed or damaged. It was a letter-perfect weasel mission. Bombers were now a mere 20 miles out, their powerful ECM jamming systems drowning the Soviet radar with electronic noise. The bombers popped up to 900 feet now, hoping to avoid the worst of the gunfire and escape without loss. They had not been warned of a possible fighter presence. Their mission was to wreck Keflavik before fighters could get there. Now surprise was on the Soviet side. Fulcrums dived out of the sun at the bombers. Their own fire control radars were nearly useless as they approached, but half their missiles were infrared guided, and the American bombers gave off enough heat to attract the attention of a blind man in a fur coat. The 
Russian fighters were experiencing an airman's dream. All eight aircraft had individual targets, and they split to hunt them singly before Keplovic absorbed too many bomb hits. Southbound flight of three never saw them coming in. Two took missile hits and exploded in midair. The third radioed for fighter cover, jinking his aircraft hard, too hard. The bomber crews pressed in on their targets. It was too late to run away, and all they could do was scream for the fighters to come back and support them. The ground-based gunners joined in. Firing over open sights, a young sergeant hit a bomber just dropping its load. The bomb bay took a dozen rounds, and the aircraft vanished in a deafening explosion that shook the sky and damaged yet another B-52. The remaining bombers were now over the target and screaming for help from their escorting fighters. Eight successfully dropped their bomb loads before turning clear of the area. The Russians were now out of missiles and attempting to engage with their cannons. That was dangerous. The B-52s retained their tail guns and one fulcrum was damaged by machine gun fire from his target and had to break off. The final element of confusion was the return of the American Phantoms. They carried only three Sparrow missiles each, and when they lit off their missile intercept radars, the Soviet fighters all received warning tones from their defense system. The fulcrum scattered and dove for the ground. The Phantoms were short on fuel. They could not press their attack and turned away without a single kill. The surviving bombers were now safely hidden in the cloud of jamming. The Soviets reformed and moved back to Keplovic. The first battle had mixed results. The Americans lost half their bomber force in return for damaging three of Keplovic's five runways. The Soviets had most of a SAM battery smashed to little gain but Keflavik was still usable.